Number 10, Wally destroyed the Earth. Now, while Wally is definitely one of the cutest characters Pixar has created, even though he's just a robot, this theory shows that cute doesn't always mean peaceful. The theory goes that Wally was just another waste collection robot built to help with the Earth Recovery Act, but he either had some crossed wires or just wasn't very good at his job, and he loved to collect trinkets and little human artifacts, but all the other robots just doing their job were compacting anything and everything they could get their little grippers on, including Wally's stuff. This made the little robot snap and he started destroying the other robots bit by bit and keeping the parts for himself. We see this in the movie when he takes a part off of a downed robot to replace his worn out treads. Over time, Wally cannibalized the rest of the robots, allowing him to continue to function for over 700 years, way past his original life cycle. And now he can collect his trinkets while still doing his job in peace. But at what cost? With all of the other collection units broken, the trash problem only gets worse until we see the world as it stands at the beginning of the film. Number 9. Andy's Monster uh, Before I move on, please hit those like and subscribe buttons if you're enjoying the video so far, I'd really appreciate it. In Monsters Inc, we learn that all children have a monster that is assigned to scare them so that they can collect the screams for energy. But since all the Pixar movies are connected, that means that characters from other movies have monsters too. In one of the training montage scenes in Monsters Inc, we see Randall Boggs practicing his camouflage skills up against many different backgrounds. One of which is the same blue sky with clouds wallpaper we see on Andy from Toy Story's bedroom walls. Since Randall is the only one who can turn invisible like this, it shows that he is preparing up against things he may actually have to blend into. Randall seems to be the reason that Andy needs his toys for protection. Other scenes in the movie show a room that has the same poster Sid does in his room, showing another connection to Toy Story and why Sid may have been so mean. Number 8. Marriage Turned Inside Out I love Inside Out for giving a generation of kids a way to think about their emotions and teach them that finding a balance and talking about your emotions is the real key to happiness. But not all the characters in the movie have learned that lesson yet. It seems as though Riley's parents have a lot of work to do on their own, or more likely, together. When we have the brief glimpses inside of her parents' heads, we can see what's really going on. Sometimes her dad just isn't listening and is replaying an old memory, or sometimes they're distracted by their own emotions. While we would all hope that joy is the emotion running all of our controls, it seems that her parents aren't so lucky. Her dad's main emotion seems to be anger, with him running the show, yelling and getting literally hot-headed at the slightest things, while inside her mom's head, sadness takes center stage. This shows that the two may not be in the healthiest of places on their own, let alone as a couple. And I'm sure that this has led to some strife in Riley's life. Personally, I think that everyone needs to see a therapist a few times in their life. It really helps, I promise. And hopefully Riley's parents get some counseling and can learn to put joy back at the center of their controls. Number 7. All in the Family While the story of Ratatouille takes us on a journey of Linguini becoming an amazing chef, thanks to his rat friend Remy, for lack of a better term, driving him from under his chef's hat, many believe that this is not the first time that this has happened in the Pixar universe. If you look closely at the cover of the Food and Wine magazine in the opening sequence, you can just make out what appears to be something under Chef Gusto's hat. Some believe that this is his own little chef who helped Gusto become the culinary star he was. But if a quick picture isn't enough to convince you, how about this? When Skinner is trying to figure out if Linguini really is the heir to Gusto's restaurant, he has a DNA test performed. He uses hair taken from Gusto's hat and some DNA collected from Linguini. But the first time the lawyer ran the sample, it came back as rodent hair. We're led to believe that this was a hair taken from Linguini and was mixed up with Remy the Rat's hair. But we never see a hair sample taken from Linguini. It's actually implied that Skinner used saliva that he got from the wine glass when he and Linguini were drinking wine in the office. So there was actually a rat hair in Gusteau's toque, and some even believed that it was Remy's mom who was under there, and she was likely killed by Skinner just before the review that brought down Gusteau's restaurant. Number 6. Carpocalypse This theory is pretty well known, but I still think it's worth talking about here. There are so many interesting things about the cars world that just don't make sense. Like if there are no humans around, why do the cars have handles? Why are there human sized doors and staircases and rooms that cars couldn't operate? Unless the world was originally built by and for humans. More examples like the London Eye and the Eiffel Tower and the fact that sidewalks exist at all prove this theory further, but how did we get here? 
Some think that at some point in the not so distant future, AI built into cars becomes self aware, and after implanting itself into all the cars being built, decides that humans were no longer necessary and disposed of them all. After a few thousand years with fuel supplies running low, the cars actually began to convert the human remains into fuel, like how we use fossil fuels in our current age. Crazy stuff. Number 5. Crazy Coincidence Sticking in the Cars universe, we actually now get to include the Planes movies as well. These films obviously take place in the same world, as planes and cars are seen interacting together all the time. But Planes gave us a very interesting look into the anthropomorphic vehicle's history. We learned from the character Skipper that he fought in what was essentially World War II. But we've established already that there are no humans left on this world, so does that mean that the cars have repeated some of humanity's worst atrocities? Some Reddit theorists believe so, and that opens up the floor for so many more questions, like was there a car Churchill? Was there an evil mustache Volkswagen? And on another note, if there's a car Pope, does that mean that there was also a car Jesus? So many questions, so little gas mileage. Number 4. Incredibles United There is a steadfast rule in the Incredibles films from superhero costume maker Edna Mode. No kicks! The main reason for this seems to be because she designed the costume for a teen hero named Stratogale, who met her untimely demise due to her cape. Stratogale had many powers, including the ability to talk to birds, and unfortunately, like many birds before her, she got caught in an airplane turbine. But since a bird in an engine causes major damage to a plane, surely a whole human would cause way more. In 1989, one of the worst single aircraft disasters happened when United Airlines Flight 232 suffered an engine failure, causing the plane to crash land and only 184 of the 296 passengers survived. The plane in The Incredibles bears resemblance to one from United Airlines. Heroes have also been in hiding for 15 years until the film's release in 2004. 15 years before that being 1989. Some believe that in The Incredibles universe, the tragedy of Stratogale and the crash of Flight 232 are one in the same. And that is the reason the heroes had to go into hiding. Number 3. Brave Boo. Boo is by far one of the most adorable characters in the Pixar universe. She's sweet and funny, and she's so very, very sneaky. But some believe that she grows up to be something a bit more sinister. The witch from Brave. Some theorists think that Monsters Inc. takes place far into the future, and that the doors they go through don't just lead to different locations, but to different times as well. And this is one of the main ways that the joint universe theory is held together. Boo learns and remembers that doors are somehow the key to finding Sully, or Kitty, again, and devotes her whole life to discovering this secret world. She eventually gains access, but goes through a door that sends her back in time, to the Middle Ages. Here she learns all sorts of magic from the Will of the Wisps, including the spell that turns Merida's mother into a bear. The driving plot of Brave. Far-fetched, I know, but in the witch's hut is a mountain of evidence proving the witch is a time-traveling boo. One of the wood carvings is of the Pizza Planet truck, and there's a drawing of Sully on a log in the background, and the witch seems to often disappear through doors. Coincidence? I think not! Number 2. Shopper's Syndrome This next theory is one that I haven't really heard talked about much. It states that the company by and large, the same one that seems to own most of the human world in WALL-E and earlier on as the company that made Buzz's batteries in Toy Story 3 and the company that forced Carl to leave his house in Up, was actually founded by Syndrome, the villain from the first Incredibles movie. As a young inventor, he created all sorts of robotic technologies that would go on to change and conquer the world. Many of the technological gadgets in WALL-E have a direct connection to Syndrome, such as the zero-point energy that restrains Eve, who also uses flight and organic scanners like Syndrome's Omnidroids. After his death, the company moved away from producing killer robots and began making commercial products, and monopolizing every industry that it could, until eventually, they took over the world just like its founder always wanted. Number 1. All the way up. This final theory is one that I personally believe to be the most plausible and the most heartbreaking. And here's the main thesis. The story of Up is actually Carl Fredrickson's journey to the afterlife, to finally be with his wife Ellie again. Now let's break it down. First of all, the amount of balloons Carl used to lift his house off of the foundations, which Pixar has said is 20,622, is not nearly enough to perform such a feat. So right there, we have a clue that this may not have been real. 
Many think that Russell is Carl's guardian angel, but he still needs to earn his wings. Or, in other words, once he earns his assisting the elderly badge, his training will be complete and he will be a full wilderness explorer, or a guardian angel. So now, we have an old man lifting off the ground into the sky and traveling to Paradise Falls. Sure sounds like the journey to heaven to me. Throw in an evil person masquerading as a childhood hero who has evil dogs doing his bidding, not unlike the Hounds of Hell, and you have a pretty good allegory. In the end, Carl reaches Paradise Falls, and we can only hope he is at peace and with Ellie. Coming at number 10, we have Tay Ka. I mean, going from a massive island covered in foliage and beauty, and then changing into a huge fire monster that everyone is afraid of sounds like a curse to me. If you don't remember, Tay Ka was the antagonist from the movie Moana, one of the biggest Disney hits in recent years that has the legend of all legends in it, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. In the movie, Tay Fetty is an island goddess who wants to bring good to the world. But then, The Rock's character Maui, a demigod who has a massive hooked weapon, sneaks in so he can steal her heart. And not in a good way. He physically removes her heart from this god so he can use the magical powers. As you can imagine, having your heart ripped out of your chest by some dude who just snuck in to steal it probably would leave you in a bad mood. She becomes a living volcano that lays waste to everything around her. That's until her heart is returned to her and she can become her lush green self once again. And guys, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the little notification bell and stick around until the end of this list because I'm going to be reading out some questions from my Instagram inbox. Coming in at number 9, we have Princess and the Frog. This would suck. I don't know how many of you out there have seen Princess and the Frog, but this movie has one of the worst curses in movie history. So in this movie, you have Naveen, who is a young hunk just wandering around the world as handsome as anyone could be. And then you have have Lawrence, who is a little told stool of a man who really would like to know what it feels like to have the body of a young NFL superstar. Well, then Lawrence finds a voodoo doctor who will give him his dream. A deal is struck, and the voodoo doctor turns Lawrence into an exact copy of Naveen. But now there's a problem. You can't have two rock solid hunks walking through the world, especially when they're mere copies of each other. So the voodoo witch doctor turns Naveen into a frog, probably one of the worst animals you could ever get turned into. You're so low on the food chain, you're all slimy and slippery, and you gotta eat bugs, and sometimes French people will try to boil you in a pot. But on top of all this, Naveen has to watch his body walk off and ruin his hunky image while he's stuck in a frog body. That's Horrible. Coming in at number eight, we have Kania. I mean, there could be worse fates. I don't know how many of you have seen Brother Bear, but in this movie, the main character Kania makes a huge mistake and kills a bear, and the spirits don't like this. Now there is a bear missing from the force, and Kania must take its place so that it will bring balance to the force and teach this dude a lesson. But as I said before, there could be worse things that could happen in the world. Bears are a pretty dominant force in nature, so you wouldn't be preyed on by too many other things other than humans. Also, you get to sleep for half the year. When you wake up, you have all the fish and food you want to eat, and you can just eat as much as you want. You get to get as fat as possible, then you find a mate, you mate, maybe you fight a couple times, and then when you're all plump and satisfied, you head back to your hole to sleep until next year, and you miss the whole winter, which is the worst part of the year anyways. I mean, that kind of sounds better than hanging out in an office with a vitamin D lamp blasting in your face so you don't feel tired all day. Coming at number seven, we have sleeping Beauty. This is probably the most famous curse of any Disney movie. You have the beautiful princess in Sleeping Beauty. It's her birthday. Like literally, it's the day she is born. The king sends out an invitation to everyone in the kingdom to come see his new little girl. All the fairy godmothers come some nights. Literally everyone is invited, except for Maleficent. She gets pretty salty that she never got an invite to this big day, so she shows up anyways and puts a curse on the poor baby. You have to be pretty ice cold to put a curse on on a baby. On her 18th birthday, she would fall asleep and never wake up. And sure enough, on this girl's 18th birthday, she pricks her finger and then she falls into a coma. Then, of course, the prince comes in, he goes to Maleficent's castle, he kills the witch, and then the day is saved. Yay! What if Sleeping Beauty woke up after all of that and she was like, thanks for doing that, but I really just like you as a friend. Coming in at 
number six, we have Cusco. Being turned into a llama doesn't sound like the best day of your life. I mean, there are a lot of animals that it would be cool to get turned into, like a shark or an eagle, but I don't think llama would be high on my list of things to come back as. In the movie, we have Cusco, who is a fun-loving, groovy emperor. And then you have Yasma, who wants to take the throne of the emperor. So she sets up a plan for him to be killed, to be poisoned. This is a classic move for when someone is trying to usurp you. But the plan gets messed up. It leads to the emperor actually getting turned into a llama. He loses his royal status, but along the way, he learns how to be a better person and eventually gets his groove back, which actually doesn't involve eating grass and spitting. Next on the list, we have Jafar, one of the best Disney villains of all time. The sorcerer who has his eyes set on the kingdom of Agrabah. He wants all the power in the world and he'll do just about anything to get it. But here's the thing, Jafar doesn't want to just rule a kingdom. He wants to be an all powerful being and he gets so close, but then he makes a little mistake. Eventually, Jafar gets his hand on the genie lamp and he wishes not to be the ruler of Agrabah, but to be an all powerful genie himself. Seems like a smart move. You'll have unlimited magical power, but he forgets to ask to be a free genie. So then he gets the power, but he's now locked away in his own lamp. And the only way he can have his freedom from this lamp will be if someone wishes for him to be free. You were so close, dude. Just changing your wish a little bit would have changed your life so much. But now you're stuck in a lamp and I don't think you're gonna get out anytime soon. Next on the list, we have Ariel. Now she did sign up for this curse, but this girl was a little too young and dumb to know what she was getting herself into. We all know the story of a little mermaid. She's living in a kingdom under the sea. She's a princess. She's literally in the 1%, but of course she wants more. Standard rich kid. Well, this Disney princess decides that she will throw everything away to try and chase some love. But the person she's in love with isn't just any dude, but a surface dweller. So she trades her voice for some legs and tries to woo the prince of her dreams. Little did she know that the person she sold her voice to, Ursula, was setting her up so she could take her daddy's trident and control the ocean. Also, not being able to speak sounds like a pretty horrible curse. Next on the list, we have the beast. Curses don't really get any worse than this. You're a king, you're royalty, you're living the high life. Another case of rich kid who doesn't know how to act right because wealth has separated them from the rest of the world. Well, if we dive into the story of Beauty and the Beast, the beast was a young boy and one day a traveler comes to his door and asks if they can spend the night in their castle. He rejects the traveler and it turns out that the traveler is a witch and she curses him and everyone in the castle. The prince becomes a horrible beast and all of the other people who work for him get transformed into living odds and ends around the house. To go from a king to a monster is a pretty hard change. And to cap things off, if he wants to get changed back, he needs to convince someone to fall in love with his beastly self before the final petal falls off a magical rose. My god. Coming in at number two, we have Hercules. This would suck big time. You're a god, and then you have your godly powers taken away from you because your uncle is feeling a little sour. The gods are so petty. Just let me live, bro. I'm a baby. I never did anything to you. If you don't know, Hercules was born and then stolen from his crib and then forced to drink a spell that would change him moral. Now it almost worked, but he didn't drink the last drop. So he kept his godly strength, but now he couldn't come back to Olympus because even though he was insanely strong, he was now mortal and no mortal can live in Olympus. So he must walk the earth wondering who he's supposed to be. Then he eventually learns that he was meant to walk among the gods and he goes, on a quest to get his rightful seat by his father's side on the mountain of the gods. But finding out that you're supposed to grow up living the life of an almighty being, tasting ambrosia, never needing to worry about anything, and literally being a god, but you were cursed to be mortal? Being a god amongst men is probably how Joey Chestnut must feel. God, it's too much. So much. <laughs> There's only one thing that I can think of that would be worse than that. For the number one spot, we have Monsieur Toilette. Disney has been going out of their way to remake a lot of the Disney classic movies and turn them into live action films. And for the most part, they've been pretty close to the original movies, but there is one part from the live action Beauty and the Beast that is 
horrifying. So we all know the story of Beauty and the Beast. We have covered it a little already. You got a castle full of people who are cursed. One of them got turned into a beast and the rest of them got turned into different items around the house. Some of the people are teapots, some of the people are candelabras, but one dude had the worst fate of all. In the deleted scenes from the live action Beauty and the Beast, we see that there is someone who got cursed with being the toilet. That's right, for however long these people were stuck in this state, one dude just had people poop inside him. My god, that is a curse so horrible you would think it would be in an Eli Roth movie. Starting off this countdown we have Moses Arias. You might know him best as his iconic role of Rico on Hannah Montana. I think we all had a love-hate relationship with his character. I mean, his character was hilarious at times, but also a little devil with the tricks he played. I mean, him and Jackson sure had a weird relationship, but it's what made the show so great. Now our innocent looking Rico is all grown up. He's now got his ears pierced and rocks the facial hair. Had it not been for his distinctive ears and nose, I don't think I would have recognized him. He went from an innocent looking tiny lad to a guy that looks like he doesn't play by the rules. Some iconic roles he did after Hannah Montana would be Pitch Perfect 3, where he plays rapper Pimplo, or Five Feet Apart, you know, that big tear jerker, and he plays Poe, a patient with cystic fibrosis. You can also catch him in his reoccurring role in the TV show Jean-Claude Van Johnson, where his look drastically changed. It's just weird seeing him go from his role of Rico to now playing more serious and dramatic roles. In our ninth spot, we have Sterling Knight. And if you guys are liking this video so far and want to see more videos like it, then make sure to give it a big thumbs up. Man, I remember having the biggest crush on him back in the day. Sterling Knight actually starred in one episode of Hannah Montana back in the day before he became a huge Disney Channel star. Some other notable work he did was Seventeen Again with my husband, Zac Efron. Then he moved on up and got Sunny with the Chance, where he played Chad Dylan Cooper. And of course, we can't forget his role as Christopher Wilde in Starstruck. That movie was actually so good, don't come for me. Nowadays, Sterling Knight is still rocking his blonde hair, but can occasionally be seen with a thick, big beard that makes him totally unrecognizable. After his Disney days, he appeared on the show Melissa and Joey and the Go 90 comedy series In the Rough. Moving on to number eight, we have Alexa Penavega. You may recognize Alexa for playing Carmen in Spy Kids. Now, I was gonna put Junie on this list as well, you know, Carmen's little brother in Spy Kids, the guy with curly red hair, but honestly, he looks the exact same. Also, fun fact, he's married to Megan Trainer. Anyways, since Spy Kids, Alexa has been killing it. She has a long list of TV shows and movies that she has starred in. Not only that, but she is currently married to Carlos Penavega from Big Time Rush, and they have two adorable kids together. And they are currently expecting their third together. Seriously, her and Carlos are couple goals. And Alexa has grown up to become a beautiful woman. Like, she is drop dead gorgeous. I'm jealous. Coming in at number seven, we have Allison Stoner who I absolutely adore and has matured greatly since her Disney Channel days. Alison Stoner is an actress, singer, and dancer. She has been killing it since her childhood. You can see her dancing in Missy Elliott's music video for Work It or Eminem's Just Lose It. From there, she went on to be Sarah Barker in Cheaper by the Dozen. And I still ship her and Taylor Lautner together. I want it to happen. Some other iconic roles she has been in would be Drake and Josh, That's So Raven, and of course, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, where she plays little tomboy Max. Then of course, she got the role as Caitlyn in Camp Rock. And how could I forget to mention that she played the voice of Isabella in Phineas and Ferb. Allison has been absolutely killing it. Nowadays, she uses her platform to shed light on important issues going around the world. She also is a big advocate for mental health. She also offers movement and dance classes for any and everyone. I had the chance to talk to her briefly and she is honestly an amazing individual. But you may not recognize her because she recently shaved her head in her music video, Stripped Bear. 
all to cut away the pain she felt from child stardom. And this was kind of her way of having a fresh new start. In our sixth spot, we have Mia Tellerico. I'm, I hope I said her last name right, I hope so. So you may not recognize the name, but Mia played baby Charlie on Good Luck Charlie. She is now 12 years old and it makes me feel freaking old. In the show, she was just 10 months old when she was cast and the show ended when she was around four years old. And now she's 12. Time is just flying by. And she's still going to school while still acting. Her latest role would be Paige in the TV series Manny. I still can't believe how grown up she is. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Roshan Fegan. Roshan is an American actor, rapper, and dancer. He first starred in Camp Rock alongside the Jonas Brothers and Demi Lovato. And then he went on to become a star in the Disney Channel original series, Shake It Up, where he played the character Ty Blue. And let me tell you, he has completely grown up. He is a complete baddie now. He's rocking this like ash blonde gray hair and he's going for a more edgy look and I'm absolutely obsessed with it. And of course, he's still dancing and rapping. As for acting, he's been doing more voice acting than on-screen acting lately. His latest roles are the voice of Casino in Glitch Tex and the voice of Elbone in Dragon's Rescue Riders. In our fourth spot, we have Bobby J. Thompson. You may recognize Thompson as playing Stanley on That's So Raven. <laughs> I had to do it, I'm sorry. His relationship with Corey and Eddie was the best. All three of them were hilarious characters. Stanley was just a little rascal. Stanley! <laughs> now he is 25 years old and he is ripped. He looks nothing like he did on his Disney Channel days. But according to Google, he never got his growth spurt, so he's still around 4'11". But it looks like he's still doing acting while also being a dancer, rapper, and comedian. In 2019, he starred in the show Living Rooms, and he's currently working on a project called Rich Christmas, and that's according to his IMDb page. In our third spot, we have Sierra McCormick. This girl had the biggest glow up of all time, and now I have a major crush on her, I'm not gonna lie. So before her big role as Olive on Ant Farm, Sierra actually starred in an episode of Hannah Montana. Then after Ant Farm, she also starred in some episodes on Jessie. But now she has ditched her long blonde hair and is rocking a short red bob. She honestly looks so good, she rocks it. But I would have never realized that that was her. Similar to Alison Stoner, she is using her platform to spread awareness of worldwide issues. And she's still continuing to work on a number of projects. In our second spot, we have Stephen Anthony Lawrence. He's just an actor with such a distinct face. He's probably best known for his role as Beans in the Even Stevens Show. But he was also in Cheaper by the Dozen and Kicking and Screaming and The Cat in the Hat. Anyways, now he is 30 years old and definitely changed a lot. Now, he started balding at a young age, which is one reason why he looks so different now. People were concerned about him for a while due to a series of pictures that he uploaded to his social media page. Like an image of him in his underwear and shirtless with a dog collar and leash on. On top of that, he posted a number of questionable Facebook statuses, but his IMDb page says that he's still working on a bunch of upcoming projects, so that's good. And in our number one spot, we have Orlando Brown. Honestly, That's So Raven, I just, I love that show and the theme song. Everything about it was just perfect, and Raven's outfit Oh my god, she was serving looks. Orlando Brown was best known for Eddie Thomas on That's So Raven. Or if you're a real OG, then you know he played the voice of Fillmore in Disney's Fillmore. Another really great show. But anyways, things sadly turned south for Orlando. He has been arrested and charged a number of times. In 2011 and 2013, he was arrested for driving under the influence. In 2014, he was reported to the police for threatening a woman and her daughter. Then in 2016, he was charged with domestic violence for getting violent with his girlfriend, and was also charged with obstruction and drug possession. On top of it all, in 2018, he got a tattoo of Raven Simone's face on his chest. It's quite interesting. And he's got a bunch of neck tattoos. He's definitely changed a lot since his Disney Channel days. Starting off this countdown, we have the mermaid killer. So I'm gonna get straight to the point. Captain Hook 
is a murderer. It's thought that Captain Hook killed Ariel's mom. So in the third Little Mermaid movie, we find out that Ariel's mom is killed by pirates. Now if we look at Peter Pan, the movie features a red-headed mermaid that looks an awful lot like Ariel and her mom. Not only that, but in Peter Pan, the mermaids were scared of Captain Hook and his crew, probably because one of their mer pals got killed by them before, and Ariel's mom suffered the same fate. That's also probably why King Triton is so scared of humans, because they're the ones that took his wife away from him. Coming in at number 9, we have Wally. Aw, Wally, he's such a cute little innocent robot. Or is he? Let's take a closer look at him. So the film takes place on a completely destroyed Earth. Wally is responsible for cleaning up the waste that covers the Earth. But theory goes that Wally is actually responsible for the current state of the world. Theory states that Wally actually killed off all of his fellow robot companions and in this battle ended up destroying Earth. Earth. That's why Wally is the only one standing. He killed off all the other robots. Then he uses parts of the dead robots to keep himself alive. Okay, that just turned the movie into a horror film. In our eighth spot, we have the Planet of the Lions. Of course, I'm referring to Lion King. So, theory goes that Lion King takes place in a Planet of the Apes type world. Animals are now the dominant species that have taken over the world. This happened when humans started testing drugs on the animals. This ended up increasing their intelligence, just like in the movie The Planet of the Apes. Then over time, these advanced animals gave birth to more advanced animals and, well, it continued on until they took over the world. In our seventh spot, we have the AI. Cars. Disney Pixar's Cars was another really successful film. Owen Wilson killed it as Lightning McQueen. But Miter has to be my favorite. <laughs> I just love him. Oh my god, I had to do that. So Cars takes place on an Earth devoid of humans. All that's left are cars that act and experience emotions just like humans. Well, theory goes that Cars takes place several thousand years in the future, and they are highly advanced AI cars. These cars became so smart that they killed their owners and took on the personalities of them. See, this is why we need to stop with AI. Robots are becoming way too smart. They're going to end up taking over the world. I say that while there's an Amazon Alexa right there, probably listening to me. Making our way down the list, number six, we have Beauty and the Beast. So at the end of Beauty and the Beast, spoiler alert, I guess, even though you all should have seen this movie by now. But at the end of the movie, Belle's kiss and love turns the beast and his workers back into humans. But what's weird is that in other films, you can see the beast and his workers back to their original forms. Like in Mickey's Magical Christmas that came out after Beauty and the Beast. We see the beast and Lumiere and Cogsworth back to their cursed forms. They're no longer humans. So theory goes that they got to become humans again for only a little bit before being changed back. Either this is because Belle is slowly falling out of love with the beast, or because the enchantress is truly evil and wants the beast to be a beast forever. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the CIA agents. Now we will be taking a look at one of my favorite Disney movies, Lilo and Stitch. So in the movie, Lilo's primary caregiver is her sister. What happened to her parents? Well, it said that they died in a car crash. But did that really happen? Reddit user Capu underscore KOA thinks not. They think their parents were actually CIA agents. Let's look at the evidence. So in the movie, it's revealed that Cobra Bubbles, the social worker, was once a CIA agent that worked with the Galactic Council. What? So you're telling me that once he was a CIA agent and then out of the blue he was like, actually, you know what? I'd rather become a social worker. No, I think he was friends with Lilo's parents and when they died on a mission, he was shook and he couldn't go on working without them. Now, let's take a look at Lilo. She's a pretty interesting kid. 
First off, her selection of books are not suitable for a kid her age. Some of her books include Practical Voodoo, Iowa's Roadmaps, and Oyster Farming. Theory goes that those books were her father's, and he had a wide range of topics to read about as research for when he went on undercover assignments. Also, Lilo loves to take photos. She might have been influenced by her father, who would take pictures of his targets. I kind of like this theory. Like, I wouldn't mind a movie where Lilo and Stitch go on a mission with her parents. In our fourth spot, we have Enamold. <laughs> By far, one of my favorite Disney characters ever. Like, she's such a sassy genius, but she's also a cold blooded killer. Yep. So in the film, we see that Edna is so opposed to capes. Why? Because tons of superheroes have died from wearing capes. She names Thunderhead, Strato Gale, Dino Guy, Splashdown, and others. All of them died tragically, having their capes caught on something and then dragged to their deaths. Well, theory goes that Edna was the suit designer for those superheroes, meaning that she is the one to blame for their deaths. That's why she's so against capes now. She has learned from her mistakes and refuses to ever make a super cape again. In fact, on the special features on the Incredibles DVD, you can see info cards on all the supers mentioned in the film. If we look at Stratogale, she was just a high school student trying to use her powers for good. But Edna's mistake cost her her life. She got sucked into a plane's turbine and got sliced to death. That's pretty dark. In our third spot, we have the Diversion. So I'm sure most of you have heard about the urban legend surrounding Walt Disney, that he was cryogenically frozen waiting to be brought back to life one day. His body is supposedly stored somewhere in Disney World. Well, theory goes that the movie Frozen was created as a diversion. Nowadays, when you Google search Disney's Frozen, only the movie pops up. But before the movie came out, if you typed Disney Frozen, the legend about Walt Disney being frozen would pop up. So now theory goes that Frozen was created so people would stop reading about this legend. Maybe because it is in the legend and it's actually true. Walt Disney was frozen and will be brought back to life soon. Actually, probably not soon. Just wait till all of this mess is figured out. <laughs> and then you can come back, Walt. Coming in at number two, we have The Little Patient. So let's take another look at the movie The Little Mermaid. In fact, it might not even be about a mermaid at all. It might really just be about a poor girl that suffers from schizophrenia. So theory goes that Ariel is not a mermaid at all. Instead, she's a patient at a mental hospital. Her sea friends, Flounder and Sebastian, are really just voices in her head. Meanwhile, she longs to be normal aka part of the normal world. Ursula is really just Ariel's doctor that gives her some meds to stop the voices in her head. And Eric, well, he's just a nurse that Ariel becomes obsessed with. Now, Ariel's room has ocean wallpaper, which makes her believe that she's underwater and is a mermaid. Most of the stuff she experiences is all just made up in her head. And in our number one spot, we have Kristoff's wardrobe. I know I touched upon this before, but you guys remember when the movie Frozen was all the rage? There was Frozen themed everything, and endless kids were singing Let It Go. Well, hate to break it to you all diehard fans out there, but the movie might be darker than that one scene with Anna and Hans. So basically, let's take a look at Kristoff. He's a sweet, handsome guy, right? Well, take a look at his wardrobe. Some fans have pointed out that his outfit looks a lot like reindeer skin. And you know what reindeer we never see in the film? Sven's mom. So theory goes that Sven's mom was killed and skinned and turned into clothes for Kristoff. I mean, they do live in the icy wilderness with limited resources. They probably would kill reindeer for meat and clothes. Looks like Sven's mom wasn't so lucky. Now the theory gets even darker, saying that the reason why Sven and Kristoff have such a close bond is because Sven feels connected to him. He doesn't even realize his best friend is wearing his mom's skin, but he's attracted to him by the comforting smell of her pelt. Okay. Whoever made up that theory is messed. Like, that is so dark. Starting off this countdown, we have Chip. 
Obviously, Chip from Beauty and the Beast got his name from the chip we see on his teacup. But the reason why he is chipped may be darker than we realized. For this, let's take a look at the movie Alice in Wonderland. If you noticed, at the tea party scene, their tea china has the same pattern as Miss Potts. So what if that is Mrs. Potts and Chip? On top of that, what if Chip got chipped when the Mad Hatter tried to saw a cup of tea in half for half a cup of tea? Meaning, he tried to literally cut a real boy in half. Ouch, that must have really hurt. But also, if this is the case, then it's incredibly dark and twisted. In our ninth spot, we have Tinkerbell. And if you guys are liking this video so far and want to see more videos like this, then make sure to give this video a big thumbs up. So, Tinkerbell is a darker character than we all realized. At the end of the movie Peter Pan, she literally tries to get Wendy killed. We see this dark side of her that we never knew about. But in the Tinkerbell movies, she seems like such a cheerful and kind-hearted fairy. So, what gives? Well, theory goes that one day the entire fairy population was wiped out, except for Tink. She then was living alone until she found Peter. No wonder she's so attached to him, she's all she has left. All her friends and family were wiped out. It gets darker when people suggested that Peter Pan is actually mind-controlling Tink. He has brainwashed her and the Lost Boys. Now, she's his servant for eternity. All I know is that I get really bad vibes from her. Coming in at number 8, we have the real villain. You know who the villain of the Toy Story movies really is? No, it's not Stinky Pete. It's Andy's mom. Yeah, she's the true villain. If you think about it, she's the one that causes all the problems. In the first film, she made the whole you can only bring one toy rule, which made Woody all jealous. In Toy Story 2, she tries to sell Wheezy at a yard sale, leading to Woody trying to save him and getting kidnapped along the way. And in Toy Story 3, she threw the toys out on the curb, and from there they got brought to Sunnyside Daycare, where Lotso Bear tried to burn them all to death. None of this would have happened if Andy's mom just had kept the toys. She's at fault for all of this. She's the real villain. Moving on to number 7, we have the Twisted Theory. This theory connects a bunch of Disney movies together. These movies are Tangled, Frozen, The Little Mermaid, and Tarzan. Get ready for this one. It might blow your mind. So the theory starts suggesting that Elsa and Anna's parents died while on their way to Rapunzel's wedding with Eugene. In Frozen, we see Rapunzel and Eugene attending Elsa's coronation, so we know that they are family friends or something. But along the way, their parents got into a shipwreck. The theory continues on claiming that the shipwreck that we see Ariel explore in The Little Mermaid is the one that took their parents' lives. Now, someone else added onto this theory, bringing Tarzan into the mix. So instead of their parents dying in a shipwreck, they believe the ship crashed upon an island. The island that we see in Tarzan. In fact, Elsa's mom was pregnant at the time and gave birth to Tarzan on the island, meaning Tarzan is the brother of Elsa and Anna. Sadly, as we know from the movie Tarzan, their parents died from a leopard attack. I know, it's a lot of things to take in, but it would be pretty cool if indeed these movies were related to each other. Moving on to number six, we have Mother Gothel. There's this crazy theory out there that Meg from Hercules grew up to become Mother Gothel from Tangled. At first, I was not buying this theory at all. But wait until I present you with the evidence. Okay, so for starters, Rapunzel got her magical hair powers from a cosmic event that created a single drop of sunlight which fell from the heavens and it grew this golden flower. Well, what if that single drop of sunlight occurred when Hercules first fell from Olympus? Now, take a look at Mother Gothel. First off, how does she know about this golden flower, and how does she know the exact song to sing to it? Well, maybe that's because Hercules told her about it, and told her the song to sing to it. Now, let's take a look at the song. The lyrics go as so. Flower gleam and glow, let your power shine. Make the clock reverse, bring back what once was mine. What if she is referring to Hercules and not her youth? In Hercules, Hercules gives up his immortality to be with Meg. So when Hercules died, she went on to outlive him. She probably misses him so much and feels guilty. So she's trying to bring him back. Not only that, in another song, Mother Gothel told Rapunzel to be aware of men with pointy teeth. Well, guess what? Hades, who kept her captive, has big pointy teeth. And lastly, one of Meg's famous lines was, ya big lug, 
What other character has said such a thing? Mother Gothel. Mind blown. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the original owner. For this one, let's bring it back to Toy Story again. And let's take a look at Andy's evil mom. This theory suggests that Andy's mom was Jesse's original owner, Emily. And from Jesse's super sad flashback scene, we can see just how much Emily hurt her. Now, first off, both Andy's mom and Emily look similar in appearance. Then we have the fact that when Andy was a kid, he used to play with Woody while wearing a red cowboy hat. The cowboy hat looks exactly like the one Jesse wears. Andy's hat is just missing the white ribbon, but with age, it probably just fell off because you can see the spot where it looks like a ribbon used to be. It could be that Andy's mom, AKA Emily, used to wear that hat as well when she was young and she saved it for her son. In fact, when she donated Jesse, you can see the red hat wasn't in the donation box, meaning she did save the hat. On top of that, the dates line up perfectly. Andy was born in 1989, meaning that his mother was probably born somewhere between the late 1950s to early 1960s. Now take a look at things in Emily's room. Her room decorations line up with that time period perfectly. So it may just be that Emily is Andy's mom, the woman that severely broke Jesse's heart. Moving on to number four, we have the psych ward. Let's move on to look at Alice in Wonderland again. That film is filled with quirky characters with loud personalities. Well, this theory is that everything we see in the film is all inside of Alice's mind. Alice is actually a patient in a mental asylum. She's given a variety of antipsychotic drugs, and while on these drugs, that's when she hallucinates about the characters. For example, the White Rabbit is her anxiety disorder. The Mad Hatter is a reflection of her ADHD and the Queen of Hearts is a reflection of her narcissistic personality disorder. So Alice in Wonderland is actually just one big hallucination. Coming in at number three, we have Cruella de Kill. Turns out that Cruella de Vil is the way that she is because she might indeed be related to a serial killer. Honestly, this has to be my favorite theory out there. So at this one, we have to look at the 100 Dalmatians book written by Dottie Smith. In the book, the original DeVille Manor was once owned by a man that many villagers were terrified of. They used to hear screaming coming from his home late at night, and then they would, and I quote, began to count their children. Literally, he was a murderer. So now that might go on to explain Cruella's weird impulses to harm animals. It's cause she's a direct descendant from a serial killer. Coming in at number two, we have the devil. Okay, this is a different theory about Cruella de Vil. Or should I say, Cruella devil. This one suggests that she is a direct descendant of the devil. In the original novel, villagers also claimed that Cruella's ancestor had a tail and supernatural powers. At one point, the man was seen with blue forked lightning coming from his body. So maybe he was the devil himself, meaning Cruella is related to the devil. Again, this explains why she's so dark and twisted. And in our number one spot, we have the Brother Eater. Now, you may have heard of this next theory because it went viral on TikTok. But basically, it involves Scar and Mufasa from The Lion King. In the movie, an envious Scar kills Mufasa in order to steal the throne. Now, I don't think any of us ever thought about what happened to Mufasa's body. Like, I just thought he was left there to decay or the hyenas got him or something. Well, it may just be that Scar ate his own brother. Yeah, I know, I'm horrified too. So according to the TikTok theory, lions sometimes eat other lions as an act of dominance. And we all know that Scar always wanted to be the dominant and more powerful one. Flash forward, in the scene where Zazu is singing to him, we can see Scar playing with an animal skull. Well, upon Googling what a lion skull looks like, it looks exactly like the skull Scar is playing with. That could literally be Mufasa's skull. So in conclusion, Scar is a sicko who ate his brother and kept his skull as a souvenir. Now starting us off at number 10 is the search for Mickey Mouse. Now, this project was a pretty big deal since it was meant to celebrate Mickey Mouse's 75th anniversary, so I thought it was only fitting that I started with this one. So the plot was meant to follow all the original characters like Minnie Mouse, Donald Duck, Goofy, and Basil of Baker Street. I don't know why Daisy Duck got cut from the squad, but evidently she did. That's a bit savage. But the movie would follow the group on their quest for finding Mickey and while on the adventure they were gonna run into a bunch 
of different Disney characters like Peter Pan, Aladdin, Alice, etc. Now, how boss will this film have been? Cameos from everyone. But apparently, the reason the project got cancelled was due to lack of ideas. The writers were finding it really hard to think of an interesting story that made sense whilst integrating all the character cameos. Honestly, good plot or not, I feel like people would have eaten up a movie with that many cameos and they should have just made it anyway. Coming in at number 9 is Yellow Submarine. Now this one may seem familiar since a little known band called The Beatles made a song of the same name as well as a movie. The original animation came out back in 1968 and the plot centers around a music loving underwater place called Pepperland. It's home to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts club band and the whole town comes under attack from the music hating Blue Meanies. Thus the protagonist goes on an adventure to enlist the help of the four members and bring them back to Pepperland. That was a very general summary of the film. I just wanted you guys to know what happened in it because I sure as not know. So Disney wanted to create a remake of the movie but there was a slight problem. The original was super trippy to the point it actually really terrified kids and the concept art for the remake would have had the same effect. Robert Zemecki was one of the creators of the remake but since the movie Mars Needs Moms tanked which he also created, he was given no artistic freedom after that. Now the effects of the movie were going to use stop motion technology like the Polar Express for example but the whole project just got shelved for being too too dark. At number 8 we have Disney's America. So back in the early 90s, Disney planned on building this theme park near Haymarket, Virginia. It was meant to showcase the history of the US and it was meant to have thousands of hotel rooms and housing, 9 themed areas and 2 million square feet just for retail. The areas were meant to be Crossroads USA, Civil War Fort, Native America, President Square, Family Farm, Enterprise, We the People, Victory Field and State. Fair. The behemoth of a project with a $650 million budget was meant to open in 1998, but that did not happen. Upon its announcement, it had a lot of support from political officials like Governor Douglas Wilder and George Allen, but opposition to the project was a lot louder than expected from Project History America. They believed the theme park would desecrate the ground over which so many men fought and died on, but then again, the park would have honored the country's history, so was it really desecrating it? I don't really know. The American Farmland Trust opposed the project as well and even nearby towns started changing their opinions. By 1994, Disney announced they would not build the park and that was the end of that. Filling our number 7 slot is gigantic, so I love how Disney takes all these old fairy tales and modernizes them for our time. For example, tales like Snow Queen aren't even recognized anymore despite that being the premise for Frozen. Now, Gigantic was an animated movie project of Jack and the Beanstalk which I'm only now realizing there isn't a Disney movie for. Is there? There isn't. Now the plot was set during the age of exploration in Spain and was going to revolve around Jack and his friendship with 11 year old giant Irma. And she would have apparently been such a character she was described as feisty, fiery and a lot to control. Unfortunately no matter how good the idea is, sometimes things just don't work out and that was the case for Gigantic. Disney and Pixar's president Ed Catmull announced the project was being shelved for now and I mean there could be a chance it makes a comeback in the future, who knows. The artwork for the film was actually super cute so I really hope it does come back off the shelf. Now number 6 is Lafitte's Island. So this project was going to be a makeover of the Tom Sawyer Island located in Disneyland and how they were going to do that was by basing it on the pirate Jean Lafitte. Park goers would go into Lafitte's crypt which would have been in a graveyard right opposite the haunted mansion. From there you would go through a catacomb themed tunnel network under the river to the island. The tunnels would have things like Lafitte's treasure vault and numerous shipwrecks. The reason for the project being abandoned was never made public but the project did inspire the actual pirate's lair that did come to fruition. Coming in at number 5 is Mort. I feel like out of everything on this list, this one hurt me the most. So this movie would have been based on the fourth Discworld book Mort by Terry Pratchett. The plot focuses on the character of Mort who goes on to become Death's Apprentice, which isn't hard to gather if you know what the title is, Mort. Mort equals dead, it's only fitting. Now on the first mission, Mort ends up messing with everything including the fabric of time when he stops the death of a specific princess. The little concept art I've seen of the movie just looks morbid and dark in the perfect way. You know, like it's not too depressing that I can't watch it, it's just nice and gothic. It's not super clear why the project got shelved but an artist on the movie called Sue Nicholas shared it was something to do with the rights of the novel. Apparently Disney just couldn't attain the rights to do the movie so they obviously didn't. And number 4 is Roger 
Roger Rabbit's Hollywood. I may get a lot of slack for this in the comments, but am I the only one that wasn't really into the whole Roger Rabbit universe? Like, I know it's a cult classic and whatnot, but I just wasn't interested. I didn't care. So Disney wanted to extend Sunset Boulevard and build Roger Rabbit's Hollywood because the movie had just come out. The project was going to have a red car trolley going up and down the street, dropping off people at a Maroon Studios replica. Now that bit would have been located where Rock and Roller Coaster starring Aerosmith is today. The area would have had three attractions, Baby Herman's Runaway Baby Buggy, Toontown Trolley, and of course Benny the Cab, but the cab later became Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin. Spielberg's company Amblin and Disney were both in a bit of a legal dispute over using the character in film, and by 1992 all future attractions were put on hold. But I mean, we still got the red trolley in Disney's California Adventure, so I mean, you know, you win some, you lose some. Filling at number three slot is Newt. This one is actually so cute, and I feel like it would have done really well, so it's annoying it never got made. So Newt's plot revolved around the last male and female blue-footed Newts in the world. The world, as well as science and man, forces the two together so they don't die out altogether. Now initially the Newts hate each other, but then they eventually come together in the end because they have to since it's a Disney movie. And I know what you're thinking, this sounds very similar to the plot for Rio, and you are 100% correct, but then again, wasn't Ants very similar to A Bug's Life? It's not like they haven't done it before. Either way, the creator of Up took the project and shelved it for his own idea, which is what ended up being Inside Out. And that movie made me cry, so I honestly don't even mind. That was a very good movie. But not to fret, because the abandoned project still makes its way into Disney films via Easter eggs. For example, in Toy Story, there's a sign in Andy's room that says Newt Crossing. Cute. Now at number two is the Enchanted Snow Palace. So this wintry project was scheduled to be a dark ride at Fantasyland within Disneyland. A dark ride is one of those rides where you board those indoor ghost trains that take you throughout the ride. Now Mark Davis designed the project as a boat ride going along on a river of melting ice. You would go past scenes of Arctic wildlife, all while being under the Northern Lights, which has always been a dream of mine. When I was little, I wanted my honeymoon to be somewhere where I could see the Northern Lights, and then obviously I grew up, but I still really want to see them. Anyway, the ride would eventually take you into this land filled with snow giants and frost fairies known as the Realm of the Snow Queen. The concept art of the ride was insane, but it was eventually scrapped, but it did serve as inspiration for the Frozen Ever After ride at the Norway Pavilion during the World Showcase at Epcot. And finally, at number one is the Aristocats 2. Hello! Am I the only one who's truly appalled and very angry that they never made the Aristocats 2? Who doesn't want to watch the sequel of a cat movie? It'd be great. And yes, I know I'm 100% biased. I don't even care. So the movie was going to focus on Marie, the adorable white pink ribboned kitten from the first one who looks a lot like my own cat, so obviously I'm in love. Now the plot was going to feature some adventure by having the cats go against a jewel thief on a cruise ship. To make it a bit more interesting, they were going to have a love love interest for Maria on the ship as well, and they would have fallen in love as the ship went from France to Scotland, Spain, and then England. Despite how well the first movie did, Disney was worried they had come up with the plot for the sequel way too quickly. And considering how badly The Fox and the Hound 2 did, they were in no rush for another failure of a sequel. Please release it, it'll be so good. Starting off this countdown, we have the snake. You have to be careful when going to Animal Kingdom. Not all the animals are safely behind cages. In 2016, a grandma and her grandson were at Animal Kingdom when a wild snake fell from a tree and bit the grandson. Now, he was fine, the snake wasn't venomous. But the grandmother went into cardiac arrest after seeing this all happen and sadly, she passed away. Wouldn't that be a terrifying encounter? Like you go to Disney with a relative looking for a good time, and then you end up injured and your relative dead. I feel so sorry for that family. The family, of course, sued Disney World because turns out that the snake was a local Florida serpent and somehow made it onto the resort. In our ninth spot today, we have the big brawl. And if you guys are liking this video so far, then why don't you smash that like button? Imagine celebrating Christmas at Disney World only to encounter a real life Scrooge. So back in 2015, an old man was waiting for his food at a cafe in Disney World when he became tired and grumpy. And no, not like one of the seven dwarves. He was fed up saying it was taking too long. So. What did he do? He shoved one of the managers and started a huge fight among them all. At one point, he got tackled down. People were so scared that they fled the restaurant without even paying for their meals. So they dined and dashed at Disney. What a little rebel. 
In the end, the man was arrested and thrown out of Disney. Thankfully, only a few were injured in this fight. But still, imagine witnessing that fight on a time of holiday cheer. I bet he got cold in his stocking. Also, since when is Disney open on Christmas? Is that a thing that I just never knew? Let me know in the comments below. In our eighth spot today, we have the cleanliness. So Disney parks seem very well maintained and clean, right? Like there's no graffiti, hardly any litter on the grounds, and the rides seem to be well kept. Well, yes and no. According to a cast member, all the locations that a visitor can see are kept super clean, but the areas they don't see are disgusting. For example, apparently the inaccessible parts of the Haunted Mansion ride are gross. Like they are dusty, filled with cobwebs, and they have a nasty stench. And no, that was not part of the attraction. And they even found asbestos there. But obviously the park guests aren't supposed to know that. So it's okay, right? No, I'm sorry, that's gross. According to the same worker, every time she came home from her shift, she stunk and had to take a shower immediately. Yikes. Coming in our seventh spot, we have Splash Mountain. Disney has strict protocols in place to keep all its guests safe. Most of the injuries that have occurred on rides have been a result of people not listening to the safety protocols, like standing up in a ride or unbuckling themselves during the rides, etc. Sadly, this happened to a man riding the Splash Mountain ride. According to a Disney employee, he tried to get out of the ride and ended up getting struck by the raft behind him. He died from the impact. Police said it was a very strange incident, and as a result, Disney had to put even stricter protocols in place. In our sixth spot today, we have the illegal rider. So Disney has those height and age restrictions on rides for a reason, please follow them. It can be dangerous if those protocols aren't followed. Well, according to one Disney employee, they were horrified after encountering someone who was basically trying to cheat the system. So this was on the Space Mountain ride. They were doing their checks to make sure everyone had their little seat belts and I guess harnesses on correctly and they saw a man with a large bag by his feet. The bag then started moving. The employee demanded he open the bag to show what was in there, but he kept refusing. Finally, the crew member got the bag, opened it, and inside found a kid. The parent had tried to hide their kid in a bag so they could still go on the ride. Are you kidding me? Like, that is so dangerous. They were literally going to risk their kid's life to just go on a Disney ride. That is insane. But also, according to employees, this happens more often than you would think. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the gun. Don't know how Disney let this pass security, but someone managed to sneak a gun into Disney. So a grandma and her grandson were riding the dinosaur ride from the dinosaur movie. Like, whoa, major throwback. I remember that ride. Anyways, at one point she kicked something on the floor of the ride and she was like, hmm, that's suspicious. What is that? She bent down to see what it was and turns out it was a fully loaded gun. How someone managed to bring that into the park baffles me. Also, why? Anyways, they alerted the ride attendant and the police were called. The police found out that the gun belonged to a man named Angelo Lista. He claimed he didn't know he couldn't bring a fully loaded weapon onto a children's ride. Like imagine if that thing went off, that would have been bad. Anyways, we still don't know why Angelo decided to bring that with him, but at least no one got injured. I bet that that was one unforgettable day. In our fourth spot today, we have the ghost of Walt Disney. According to a number of employees, they believe that the ghost of Walt Disney haunts his park. In fact, a ghost was supposedly caught on security camera footage. You can see this ghostly figure just casually strolling through Disney. Take a look. Security caught this weird ghost on tape and immediately asked others what they thought it could be. There has been some debate on it, like some say it's a glitch or a monitor burn or a reflection. Whereas others believe it's the ghost of Walt Disney himself. Or Javier Cruz, a cast member that lost his life in 2004 during a parade flow at Disneyland. But what do you guys think of this? Is this real footage of a Disney ghost? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Coming in at number three, we have the cover up. According to a former Disney World College Program cast member, there once was a man who took his life in one of the Disney hotel rooms. And Disney used its magic to cover it all up. So basically, the room in which it happened had its door and windows covered with a pardon our dust renovation sign. When police arrived, they had a bunch of costumed characters and cast members go to one section of the hotel for a meet and greet to distract the guests from seeing the police come into the building. 
apparently Disney constantly does this. They always divert your attention when something traumatic happens. For example, another employee said that they used fire jugglers to distract people when an animal control officer had to get a venomous snake out of the hotel's water fountain. And this guy only had 15 minutes to do it while the show was going on. Honestly, it just seems super stressful working for Disney. I swear, some Disney workers are like trained as if they're part of the FBI or something like that. In our second spot, we have the stunt gone wrong. According to a number of articles, the Hollywood Studios Indiana Jones epic stunt spectacular show was one of the most dangerous shows at Disney. Also, what a name. Hollywood Studios Indiana Jones epic stunt spectacular show. Geez, say that 10 times fast. Now, why is this? Well, a number of stunt performers have gotten badly injured in this action-packed show. Apparently, one performer fell 30 feet to the ground after his support cable broke. Another time, a different employee fell 25 to 50. Another time, a different performer fell 25 feet to the concrete. And a third fell 25 feet to the ground after a prop ladder broke. Thankfully, those performers all survived. But in 2009, one performer passed away after performing a tumbling roll. For this trick, the performer had to jump in the air, dive over another performer, and then tuck and roll onto a mat. But something went wrong, and the performer ended up landing wrong and snapping their neck. That is absolutely heartbreaking and terrifying. And in our number one spot today, we have the Haunted Dolls. I think that the scariest ride in Disney would have to be It's a Small World. Like, take a look at those terrifying dolls. And apparently, they're haunted, okay? According to a number of Disney employees, they have seen the dolls in the ride change positions, disappear, or even move when the ride is off. Some even say that their hair appears to grow on its own, as if they're alive. In fact, every couple of months, Disney's cosmetology team goes in and cuts the doll's hair because they grow. But they say it's just the humidity combined with gravity and that causes the hair to stretch. Either way, it's freaking creepy. According to one employee, they arrive for their morning shift only to find that a couple of dolls switched places during the night and some vanished without a trace. So listen here, Annabelle, okay? Leave those damn dolls alone. Don't touch Disney. Mm -hmm. 